Good morning. Happy uh, February 1st to you this morning. It's good to be with you this morning, and I pray you had a great weekend. And uh, we are gathered together to look at a new book of the Bible. And this one is the book written by the beloved disciple, which would have been John. And my middle name is John, so I've always thought that maybe my, maybe I'm at some level beloved. I don't know. My, my dad was a John. My grandfather was a John. I have, my, I have two middle names. The other one is Patrick. And I have a mother that was Patricia and a grandfather that was Patrick. So I've got the I've got John, John, Patrick, Patricia, Patricia in my name. So I've always felt that was just a really great name. I don't know what that has to do with anything except that uh, it's good to be with you this morning. And I pray you had a great weekend. It is it is February. Now, February is an unusual month. If you're born in February, you are very special. There are fewer people born in February than any other month throughout the year. And the reason we know this is because February has less days than any other month throughout the year. Most of them have 28 or 20, 30 or 31 days. February has only 28 or 29. So if you're born in February, you're pretty special. And I was born in February. So obviously, obviously. So the other thing is that um, we have no birthdays today. On February 1st, we have uh, three tomorrow. We'll get into those tomorrow. And uh, also wanted to just point out that as I continue to look at the hospitalizations of coronavirus in Pima County or in the state of Arizona, it appears to me that it is rapidly declining. Uh, I don't know if I can show this or not. Um, no. Okay. So uh, the, the, the website, Arizona Department of Health Services, shows that it peaked about January 8th or so, and we are about three weeks past the peak, maybe even three and a half or four weeks past the peak. So if you look at the data, it is falling off rather nice and precipitously, and that is wonderful. So a couple things there. One is, is that most pandemics come in waves. So even without the vaccine, we'd see a falling off of the second wave. And then we also have a vaccination that has been rolled out. And I don't know what the latest numbers are, but I think, did I read it? Maybe, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be guessing if I told you. But I know the last time I looked at it, there were 25 million vaccinations, but that was about a week ago. And... Um, I think we're vaccinating about 1.25 million people a day across the across the United States, which is incredible. At that rate, you could vaccinate um, three if 330,000 people at one point. You could vaccinate those people in uh, in a very very short order, probably less than 300 days, maybe maybe nine months. I'm guessing if you wanted to give a vaccination to everybody, if they're doing 1.25 million vaccinations a day, so. That is exciting and great news, and I'm very happy about that. And um, yeah, I think we'll leave it at that. Let's see, other news. Um, I can't think of any. So uh, we're going to talk, we're going to go to John, First John. So this is a new Bible study that we're starting this morning, and this is on the first epistle over the first letter of John. Now, there have always been a debate about whether or not John that wrote this epistle is the same John that was the beloved disciple of Jesus. I personally believe it was. The early church history uh, certainly does say that John was the author of this, but one of the reasons why it's questionable is because as we'll get into this, we are not exactly sure. It doesn't say in the first chapter about, well, actually, let's just go ahead and read the first first bit of this. That actually will provide a little bit of the context. So we'll do that. We'll look at just First John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands, have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, 
And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that which we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you to make our joy complete. All right, so right off the bat, you can see how this very much mimics the Gospel of John, which is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That is the opening preamble to, to the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is different than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke open up with the birth or the genealogy or something about Jesus that talks about a temporal thing in this world, but not John. John starts at the real beginning, which is uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, at the beginning, Jesus was. Very, very much a John thing in his gospel. And so when we read this epistle, and it says that was that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands and have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. So right there at the beginning, it's a, it's a different kind of an epistle. It's a different kind of letter. And it very much mimics the style of the Gospel of John. He's talking about the Word. He's talking about the beginning, that Jesus was at the beginning. And then he says, we, we have heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked at with our hands, we touched, and all this sort of thing. There's no question that there is a certain, a, a very powerful witness here that the person who's writing this letter is one who touched Jesus, who saw Jesus, who walked with Jesus. And in the Gospel of John, it, it, you get the same thing. It's somebody who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, lived with Jesus. How else could he see the things that John saw in this Gospel? And so most scholars, I, actually, I think all the scholars say that whoever wrote 1 John also wrote the Gospel of John. And whoever wrote 1 John, the style is the same as 2 John, which is there's another epistle after this one, and 3 John, the third epistle from the same author. Now, the early church historians say that, the, that this is John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. Now, there was some question, if we ever get into the second and the third epistle of John, those letters are a little bit different. It says, from the elder to a person. And so you have to ask yourself, is John the elder or is John somebody else but but the vast majority of the early 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 witnesses to this say that that this is the letter to people from the beloved disciple one of the disciples of Jesus and I'll even further identify that he would be uh, one of the three disciples that Jesus seemed to have in an inner click Peter James and John Peter Obviously, we know about who Peter is. James and John's were brothers. They were sons of Zebedee, a fisherman. They were called sons of thunder. Uh, Peter, James, is the old, was the first disciple to be killed. John apparently was never killed for his faith. He was exiled on the ap island of Patmos, lived to be a very old age. And then his number one disciple was the bishop of Smyrna, whose name is Polycarp. I love that name, Polycarp. And then Polycarp had a bunch of disciples, and one of them was Irenaeus. So you have John the Baptist, you have John, the Apostle John, then you have Polycarp, one of his disciples, and then you have Irenaeus, who's one of his disciples. And he, Irenaeus said, without a doubt, that this letter was written by John, the Apostle, the beloved disciple of Jesus, the one exiled on Patmos, and also the author of the Gospel of John. So for me, I always go back to what the original, original church felt. And I don't know if you can have a better witness than the disciple of the disciple of John. The disciple being Polycarp and then the disciple of the disciple being Irenaeus. So 
I've always believed that this is John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And I've, I've always believed that the gospel of John was written by John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. Now, why does John fascinate me? I love Peter. I love Peter for his boldness. I love Peter because he wasn't shy. He walked on water. He, he just was very, very bold for his faith. One, he was bold for his faith. He also was a coward at some point in his faith, as we all are. But John is different. The, the records that we can kind of cobble together say that John was the youngest of the disciples, have no idea how young he could be. I'm guessing probably 14, 15, maybe as old as 18. I guess he could be a little bit older than that. Not really any, you know, any concrete evidence that shows exactly. John started at this age, but he was definitely very, very young. And as a very young disciple, he was very young and impressionable. And just imagine what it would have been like to be John, the disciple. You're out there in a boat fishing with your brother, who's probably, whenever I think about fishing with my brother, I think of my brother, Mike, who is four years older than me. And we're out there doing our thing. And then all of a sudden, this, this guy, Jesus, comes along and we leave our dad, which would be very hard to do. And then we go and we follow this guy named Jesus. And as a young, impressionable young man, I take in everything that Jesus says. Just, just take it all in. The other disciples, I think, could have been skeptical about Jesus. They could have been a little bit more mature. And so they had already formed their own opinions about Jesus. And they had to reshape those opinions and all that sort of thing. But not John. As a very young man, John is... Almost like the purest, is that, is that fair to say? He drank deeply from the water of Jesus. And my impression or how I view John is that he was one that was discipled from a very young and, and, and approachable age to be the disciple of Jesus. And Jesus loved John incredibly well, even called him the disciple that Jesus loved when at the Last Supper, you have this picture about John just leaning his head upon Jesus' breast. So there's, there's this image that, that Jesus and John were very, very close. And um, so, so John is the beloved disciple. He's, he's the youngest. He's the most malleable disciple. And I believe from that, we get this picture of like the purest view of God of who Jesus is because Jesus was able to get into John's life early enough to not have any barriers to say, this is who I am. And in that instance, unlike the other gospels, unlike any of the other people that follow Jesus, John sees in Jesus an, et an eternal presence, a bigger than life presence, somebody who has command over the universe, has command over light and darkness, has command over all things. John sees Jesus as this pre-incarnate being equal with God, being God that becomes flesh and dwells for a time in the world and then leaves to go back with God the Father in eternity existing from eternity, comes into the world for a period of time, and then goes back to the Father for a period of eternity. You get that picture from John. And so John is worth studying because how he views the world is going to be, in my opinion, one of the purest ways to look at Jesus. And that is why I want to study John this morning, because John is the beloved disciple I hope to finish this study right around Valentine's Day, which is a day of love. I really want to finish by February 17th, which is about two and a half weeks from now. And I think we can do that because John, because then at that point, I want to go into a different thing on uh, February 17th, which is also Ash Wednesday, which is also my birthday. Oh, I wasn't going to tell you my birthday. <laughs> well, there you go. My birthday's coming up in a couple, two and a half weeks, February 17th. Did you know that fewer people are born in February? So that's what I want to do. 
I want to just spend some time talking about the Gospel of John. There's some themes in here, light, light and darkness, life, truth, the new commandment, um, the fact that God's only son became flesh and dwelt among all these kind of things are themes in this little letter, which is a different letter. The other two letters are more two people. This one is like a general epistle to go out. It's almost like a condensation of the whole gospel of John in one little epistle. It'd be hard to write and transcribe the whole gospel of John to other churches. But this epistle is only five chapters and it could be easily transcribed and written and handed out to a lot of people. And maybe that's why John read it. I don't know. But that's, uh, that's basically what we see here. Now, what does he say? He says, that which was from the beginning. So again, this is the theme, that Jesus was at the beginning. Jesus and this parallels John 1.1, 1, 1, where in the beginning was the word. Jesus was at the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes. This thing that was from the beginning became flesh. And unlike the other gospels, John sees this as an, as an eternal event, as a cosmic event, where the flesh becomes, where this eternal word becomes flesh and dwells among the people. And he's not so much interested about the birth in Bethlehem and the wise men and the King Herod and all that sort of thing. John has a different view of what it was for Jesus to become flesh, to dwell among us. It's, it's, it's this cosmic event where God becomes flesh and enters into the world. That's, that's this vision that you get from John. And that he was able to see it and touch it with his hands. This they proclaim about the word of life. Now this word, word in the Greek is logos, and it carries with it a bunch of different uh, heavy concepts. It is basically very much a, a Greek philosophy that, that, that in, the, in, the, in the world, the heavenly realm, there are perfect perfections of things that that we have names for, but the perfect part of that is up in the, in the heavenly realms, in the, in the otherness. We're sinful in this world, but, but that which exists in the other world is perfect. That which exists in the other world has a perfect order to it. And, and, uh, and this logos kind of ties into that, and the logos becomes flesh and dwells among us. So that, that perfection that we see in the other world that we even give names to, that are perfect names to. Now it comes into our world and dwells among us and gets legs and arms and has a brain and talks and exists. And so John very much sees Jesus as this perfect Godhead word that comes from existing from eternity, that comes into our world and dwells among us. The life appeared. The life appeared. Now, we know that the life was born in Bethlehem, dwelt for a while, and then John the Baptist proclaimed, this is, the, this is Jesus, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, and, and, and all of that. But John just says he appears. And then, of course, Jesus did just appear to John, right? He's out there in the boat fishing with his brother and his dad, and all of a sudden, Jesus just appears to him. So he doesn't know all the story, the backstory to that. He learns it later. But that was a very profound moment in John's life when Jesus just appeared to him. And Jesus said to John, come follow me. And John said, absolutely. Where are we going? We're going to do it. And follow Jesus till the end of his life. Now, all the apostles followed Jesus till the end of their life. Eleven of the twelve died for their faith. Only John, only John was exiled on the island of Patmos and died a very old man from old age. But the rest of them died for their faith. Which is also curious, if he's the disciple that Jesus loved, did Jesus allow that to happen because he loved John so much? The early church saw the apostles as martyrs, and it was the, it was the martyrs of the early church that propelled the early church forward. Everybody wanted to be a martyr. but So there's pos it's possible that John the apostle wanted to be a martyr just like the other 11 to show his love for Jesus and all that. But maybe Jesus didn't allow John to be a martyr 
because Jesus loved John so much and just couldn't from the heavenly realm watch his beloved disciple be killed. These are the existential things that I just think about because it is curious that John died at an old age, but he was called the beloved disciple. And I wonder if there's a connection there. And I believe there is. I believe the connection is that Jesus didn't want him to. He loved him too much. There is obviously a deep and abiding love between those two. I don't know if you've ever had somebody that you've loved deeply, and I'm not talking about the erotic love, the eros love that the Greeks talk about, or it's it's a Philadelphia love, which is um, philos. It's, it's a friendship love, but Jesus also talked about agape love, which is a godly type love, but I think the, the, the relationship between John and Jesus was a deep and abiding love that transcends all kind of human patterns of love. I, when I was a, in high school, I somehow, God put me in fellowship with a, a guy, his name is Bill. Uh, he was a year younger than me in high school, but we had an incredibly deep and abiding love that I almost feel like is like a John the Baptist or John the Apostle and Jesus type of love. And if you've ever experienced that type of deep love for somebody else, uh, eventually, you know, he went and got married and, and moved to California. I married and stayed, and, and we've stayed in contact. But that period of time in high school and, and early college, or the, actually the whole entire college years, until we both kind of got married, we were just incredibly inseparable. And um, it was just a deep, deep friendship based on a whole bunch of different things, based on Jesus, based on our love for Jesus, based on our love for music, based on our love for each other. We were like brothers and very close. Uh, and, and you know these kind of these relationships because maybe you had one also. And, and if you did, praise God for that because those are just amazing relationships. Um, and that's kind of how I viewed Jesus and John. For some reason, they just connected at a very real level. And obviously, there's the three, Peter, James, and John, that, that Jesus took up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they're kind of singled out periodically throughout the Gospels. But John, if you, if you had to pick one that, that Jesus just loved at a very, very deep level, God type of love of level, I think it would be John, this apostle. And I know he loved Peter and he loved all the apostles, but there was some connection between those two that was very, very deep and powerful. And that's the guy who's writing this letter. It's the guy who wrote the gospel of John. And so it's worth just having that framework to see, all right, if you are the best friend of Jesus, and if Jesus were to say, oh, this is my best friend, John, this is... Uh, you know, we, we now say BFF, best friends forever. This is my BFF, and we might have more than one or two or three. But back when I was a kid, you had like a best friend. And that's kind of how I see John is like being a best friend. And he says that Jesus just appeared. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So John also talks about how Jesus was with the Father at the beginning. We see this in the Gospel of John. The one thing we don't see in this is that the Holy Spirit is also with God the Father and God the Son at the beginning. We just see Jesus like proceeding from the Father. And that is very powerful you have God the Father in heaven, and then Jesus proceeds from the Father. Now, there was a, a controversy early on. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm not going to be able to remember all of this, but it was called the... Uh, hmm. Well, I can't remember the name of the controversy. Maybe I'll pick that up next time. But it was basically that this early controversy in the, in the difference between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Did Jesus proceed from... Did the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, or did the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? That was the controversy, and it's called the something controversy. I can't remember it at the top of my head here. And, and this was a big deal 
did the because if we say in the creed we believe that in the holy spirit who proceeds from the father and the son who with the father and the son is worshiped and glorified that and the son was the controversy did did the Holy Spirit proceed just from the Father? Or did he proceed from the Father and the Son? Western Church said absolutely it proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church said no, we're not sure. We think he proceeded from just the Father. And uh, that was a big, 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 big controversy. It actually was one of the controversies that split the church in the Great Schism of 1054. So you'd think I would remember the name of that thing. <laughs> but anyway, um, here in the in the letter... It doesn't say that Jesus proceeded from the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's basically that Jesus proceeds from the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the, what we believe, teach, and confess is that in heaven, in where God lives and exists, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We begin our times together in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as being a triune God from which Jesus emanates from. And we see the early church struggling with the fact that there is one God of the Old Testament, and yet somehow that one God became flesh and dwelt among the people. And when he did that, did he leave his Godhead or was there still God up in the heavens or did the full entire Godhead come into the earth and become become God of the earth and then go back in the heavenly realms and all these questions that people struggle with over time. And, and there's lots of people with lots of different theories trying to parse it and look at it and everything. But if you look at John, his, he is clear. He said, the life appeared, we've seen and testified, which was with the Father and now has appeared to us. So kind of emanated from the Father and came into the world. And we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. So there's something about this son that brings eternal life. There's something that brings that is with the son that brings fellowship. There's something about the son that makes our joy complete. This is not any son. This is a heavenly son. A son departing from the Father, coming out of the Father, coming into the world that is that is amazing, is beautiful, is wonderful. He was my best friend. Let me tell you about him. That's that's what you get from from First John, and uh, and then we we're gonna continue in this book uh, to talk about what that looks like. How do you describe this guy, your best friend? When I think about my best friend from high school, he was kind, he is kind, he's generous, he's just a wonderful human being, he helped lift me up in dark times of my life, uh, someone, you know, that you, that I, I love very much, and, uh, you know, if I were to try to describe him and write a letter about him, I don't know, I don't know, I would, that would be interesting work, uh, but John does, he writes this brief epistle to describe his best friend. And that's what we're going to get into. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, I pray that you continue to join me on this letter to find out what John has to say about Jesus, because it is fascinating. And with that, let's close with prayer. Dear God, thank you from this letter from your beloved disciple. And help us to learn more about you through his words. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So thanks for joining me today. We are going to get together tomorrow at the same bat time, same bat channel. Like I said, we want to try to get through this by, by about two and a half weeks. So we've got our work cut out for us, but I think we can do it. But thanks for joining me today. May God richly bless you. Oh, I want to go over here. And um, yeah, I don't know why it always does that. All right. We'll see you later. Take care. Bye.